tuia ki runga, tuia ki raro, tuia ki roto, tuia ki waho, tuia, ta oh, tuia tato, te tangata, ke te kopapa o te hui nei, ke te kopapa o te rangi nei, Moriora, ki a katoa. Bind above, bind below, bind within, bind beyond, bind us, the people, to the purpose of our meeting, to the purpose of this day, breathe life into all of us. Well, thank you for that. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is our last policy and strategy meeting um, for the year. So just a couple of housekeeping things. Remember, uh, this has been recorded on YouTube. Um, use your microphones because we've got some staff and a board member Armstrong on Zoom. Uh, we've also got the news media in the room. You know where the toilets are outside and if it starts to shake, underneath the tables and hold. And if we get a fire alarm outside in the car park. First of all, I've got uh, apologies from Councillor Greening, Councillor Hill and Deputy Mayor Bryant. Would someone like to move that they be accepted? Move Councillor Dowler, seconded Councillor Shellcrass. All those in favour, please say aye. Against, carried. And I'd like to welcome to the table um, Karina and, and Henry Dixon, both board members, one from uh, Mochawaka and one from Golden Bay. And we've also got board member Armstrong, as I said. Now, public forum this morning, uh, we've... I have three, but I'm not sure. Is that Bruce? Is that you've just walked in? That's very good timing. Uh, and we're aiming for 12 o'clock because we've got a workshop due to start at uh, 12.30, so we need a half-hour break. And John tells me there's some grunty stuff, so we need a bit of time. So we'll just remember that today. Um, so we might start with the Golden Bay Arts Council. Gary, if you'd like to come up with your support person, and you've got 10 minutes. Let's see if I can work this gadget. Uh, I'll give you a call at, at nine, how's that? And you're representing the Golden Bay Arts Council. And then we'll go to Bruce and then Helen Lane. Um, after that, who's representing the Mapua Tennis Club. Good to see you back. So over to you, if you just um, take your seats and um, when you want to speak, you just press the talk button on the microphone and only one on at a time or it won't work. So over to you. Kia ora koutou e te whānau no Engarangi a hau, kai Clifton Mōhua e noho ana, uh, kai Mōhua pāpuri ngā toi a, uh, e pā ana, no reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Hello everybody, my name is Claire French and I'm an arts worker for the Golden Bay Community Arts Council. Um, I've been in the role for the last 20 months. We just wanted to come and speak to you today to just let you know the amazing work that we are doing over in Mohua um, and how we're improving the health and well-being for the community. So we offer arts experiences for the whole community and we bring the whole community together to celebrate the diversity of arts in Mohua. This includes big community events. So we just had our Bay Art event, which saw 1,300 visitors through its doors. We do a community light festival and Matariki celebration in June, July. We also have public uh, mural projects that we do with youth and local artists. And we're also uh, in January involved in the AMP show. So we're gonna be taking activities there. We offer free community events for Mohua. We offer free and economical workshops, arts-based workshops, that's for youth. Um, we do those every school holidays and that's by gold coin donation and they always sell out. So they're extremely popular. We do local workshops for artists. Gary's gonna talk more into that after this. Um, we have volunteer opportunities for local people, which includes youth. Uh, I have a youth placement on the Bay Arts Scheme um, who's been working with me. We also have volunteer-led community events and performance projects, which are volunteer-based. We have paid opportunities that we create for local providers and artists. That includes performance contracts, workshop contracts, mm -hmm. and service contracts. For example, Sound and Lights, the Golden Bay Weekly, local catering providers. We share information and news with the community, which includes a newsletter that goes out every six to eight weeks. And we also share arts activities on our social media channels and Facebook pages. 
we support local artists in and also um, give information to tourists in Mulhua. Uh, we have information and drop-in sessions at the Arts Council Hub, which is a council-owned building in town that we rent. We, we offer funding support, which includes creative communities funding applications. We offer marketing support um, and provide a platform to share any events and activities that are going on in Golden Bay. We offer one-on-one -on -one meetings, letters of support for local groups when they're trying to apply for funding, for example, for the Rata Foundation. We offer practical support. Uh, we have a Main Street venue, which we offer to community, uh, to community groups, which includes Te Atarangi. So they have a drop-in there on a Monday morning, uh, which is a full immersion Tadeo drop-in. We also have music groups and other community groups access the building. And we offer fundraising opportunities. For example, the Golden Bay High School did a fund an art department fundraiser as part of our Bay Art event. And we support organisations such as Dance Collective More, who are, they had a fundraising stall at our big light festival, and they raised over $900 um so yeah that's uh what i've been up to i'm going to pass you over to our new arts worker gallery who's just uh started with the ministry of culture and heritage uh koto uh Kyo -na. hi everyone I'm, I'm gary um gary smith uh i've been working as an art worker in golden bay for, for three months uh gary, can you pull your speaker a bit closer because um, you've got a slightly lot more kind of quiet. Yeah, always seven. <laughs> yeah, just so that people on Zoom can hear. Sure, sure. Thank you. Yeah, um, I've been working in the Bay for for three months, and uh, it's been an absolute. I, I, I reside in uh, at Riverside in in the uh, Mutri Valley, uh, and it's been an absolute honour to to meet um, many of the artists in the Bay and uh, um, see like how high functioning the Bay is when it comes to art. Um, I met, I've had the, the privilege of working with um, Claire on Bay Art and meeting, and you know, um, it was over 100 artists put in put in submissions. 217. With the kids, yeah, yeah, there was, um, uh, it was incredible. Um, <clears throat> it's the strength of the Bay. And my contract is to, is to walk alongside the, the artists in the Bay and, and to provide support of running a number of workshops on how to curate art, um, how to photograph art, how to write um, profiles of, of who you are and, and, and of your art. Um, I'm working, uh, starting to develop a relationship with the Nelson Chamber of Commerce to um, bring workshops that allow artists to, to put their work online um, and, and reach out beyond the Bay. Uh, another contract that I've got is with the uh, um, uh, Ministry of Culture of Heritage is to run a summer arts festival and that is uh, 10 days, it's planned for the end of January um, and we're taking the approach of the community community up so so we, we basically hold a space for the arts community to come to us and decide what that looks like. Um, the stories that I, I, I wanted to share that, and I guess it's the, the, the power of art within the community for wellbeing is um, you know, uh, one of the, the teachers at the high school talks about, you know, the struggle for our children is um, that, that they want to do everything perfectly. And she sees it as a, as a response to, to anxiety. You know, their, 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 their journey is, is, is a tricky one, you know. Um, and she sees art as, as that space where you can make mistakes, you can explore. There's, a, there's, a, there's another part of your being that's able to open up and express itself. Um, there's a, um, a very well-known artist who has spent the last uh, 30 years um, breathing life back into his culture by, by running workshops, by running Wananga. Um, that <clears throat> when I spoke to him, I, you know, I, I got the, the understanding that, you know, 30 years ago, he, he started to work with the youth to bring um, understanding through art of their culture. And that has been a major driver for, um, for the uh, that culture to to have a, a significant presence in the bay. Uh, so you know, um, uh, I guess what I'm saying is that, that art, um, and, and say bay art, it, it's what I, what I loved about bay art was the was the networking, was the chance of of um, artists to connect with each other, to um, uh, and 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 see each other's uh, where each other are progressing. Um, yeah. And I guess that's, you know, where I want to leave it is that it, it, this, on a fundamental level, art is, is um, uh, worth investing 
with listing it. Mm. Yes, that's me. Thank you. Well, we do have uh, time, so uh, for one question or two, if anybody's got a question. No. No. So everybody's happy. So thank you very much, Gary, uh, and best of luck with your endeavours. Um, Bruce, you're next. And Bruce, you get five minutes because you're an individual. Okay, so I'll give you a, a bit of a call at four and a half minutes if you, if you need it. Okay, I think you've been here before. I have. Yeah, thank you very much. Just press the button on the front and it should go. Red. That's it. And pull it towards you. That's great. Thank you. Hi. Um, uh, kia ora. Thank everyone. Um, I'm here for Businesses for Climate Action, um, and so it's an organisation, but uh, five minutes will be fine, and I have been here before. And it's just useful to give, um, I want to keep up the connection with council and with local businesses, and um, uh, I'm not asking for funding. Um, now we do need funding, but I'm not, that's not why I'm here. Um, mainly just... Uh, there's often some quite good news to pass on, and so I will do that. Um, we're a charitable trust, so Businesses for Climate Action, which also uses the, the name Mission Zero. Uh, it's a charitable trust formed because um, we actually love this planet and we're passionate about local businesses as well. And so we're, we, um, we exist to, to um, help them to cut carbon emissions and move towards greater sustainability. Now, when I was here before, um, I did mention uh, something that we had coming up, a, a, um, a, a series of workshops on emission reduction for local businesses. And um, at that time I said, you know, if we, we need, um, uh, I think we could have, managed with a minimum of, of six businesses, but uh, I said, if we don't get more than that, we're really wasting our time. So anyway, we had to um, uh, cut off sign-ups at, at uh, 35 because there's quite a lot of one-on-one um, uh, -on -one work involved. And so I got very strong support for that, I'm pleased to say, including the likes of Sea Lord, Port Nelson, Wakatu, Health Post, and a number of very small businesses. Um, I thought I'd go quickly through, because that was only a few months ago that I was here, I'd quickly through a, an interim report that we did on the, um, the period up to, um, up to the end of September. Um, so that, um, that workshop uh, went really well and, and we're having ongoing work with those businesses um, uh, aimed at cutting emissions and hopefully getting some good results with those over the next few months, and then we'll we'll run another series um, funding committed after that. Um, we had an attendance at the Aspire conference uh, recently and had some very good comments made about us, um, uh, including, for example, the uh, Chamber of Commerce Chief Executive referring to us as a standout local example of community action. Um, we've had some very good media um, connections. Um, Florence Van Dyke, one of our trustees, was named as um, one of nine Global Women Asia Sustainability Fellows. Um, she has previously been named as, as um, one of 30 under 30 um, leaders for, for, um, for Asia Pacific. Um, I have been writing articles for um, uh, Chartered Accountants New Zealand and Australia, and that goes to about 90,000 people, including um, including uh, the bulk of those in Australia. And that has been a good way of getting across, um, including some local stories. For example, Port Nelson, um, which is, is reporting um, uh, further than it needs to and in a in a way of of um, uh, you know creating good PR, but also keeping itself honest in terms of of uh, reducing carbon emissions. Um, that was time, was it? The we're close to. Oh, sorry, I, I 
<laughs> okay, okay. Um, we now have a new uh, trustee, um, Marta Carlick Neal, who has um, uh, comes with great expertise. She has previously advised Air New Zealand, Z Energy, and council city councils in Auckland, Wellington, and Christchurch, and with Port Nelson locally. Um, we, um, yeah, so we're, we're, we're finding it positive. We, we just want to keep moving on this and um, uh, support moral public, um, you know, publicity, all useful. Um, I'll leave our annual report and interim report with, I'll, I'll, I'll send those in um, later. Um, just a couple of thoughts. Um, we're already seeing some of the impacts from 1.1 degrees of warming worldwide. I won't go into those. We all need to work very hard to keep under 1.5 and businesses, farms, individuals have a part to play in that. And we really all need to be aiming for a, an 8% reduction per year. Now, I think we don't want to focus on 2050, although that's important. We really need to be looking at, at 2030 and, and what we can do now. The second reason for businesses to act is the legislation that now requires them to uh, to report on their emissions. Um, although the legis legislation refers just to 200 of New Zealand's largest companies, there's a real flow-on effect because those companies won't um, won't trade with others. They uh, companies that they trade with are going to affect their own scope three emissions. So. Um, uh, that legislation has been far more effective than um, I think many of us realise. And it's not just New Zealand, it's a worldwide trend. Um, for instance, Nestle is putting pressure on Fonterra um, to reduce their emissions because uh, Fonterra's emissions are, are Nestle's scope three emissions and they have commitments to reduce to net zero. Um, most of this is not rocket science. It's, it's, there are tools available, there are solutions available. We know what's causing uh, climate change. It's mainly burning things and waste. Um, we don't need to be experts. We just need inquiring minds and um, a bit of commitment. And we all need to make a start. Um, but don't aim for perfect. Um, we can find one thing to do, um, uh, you know, cut emissions in one area and um, try one thing and then move on to try something else after that. Um, and we all need to be good and good ancestors. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. That's slightly over uh, five minutes, so we won't have time for questions. Of clarification, <laughs> correct, cut off. Uh, you've got a big afternoon. Um, you can see Bruce outside. Okay, so uh, because we do have some stuff to get through. Um, thank you, Bruce, and I'm sure we'll see you again. Um, yeah, thank you. And to me, the biggest thing we've done is electric buses and getting people on buses rather than in cars. So this week, I rode the bus to our meetings in town, and then I walked here today. So I applaud that, Bruce. I yeah. think it's fantastic. I arrived uh, in the airport um, uh, last week. I got the bus into Nelson and out to the Yeah, It works. Yeah. Helen, would you like to come uh, up? I think you're here on behalf of the Marpur Tennis Club, but I'm sure you won't need 10 minutes to thank us. No, I'll be very, very brief. Um, so, yeah, as you said, my name is Helen Lane, um, and I'm here to represent um, both the Marpur Tennis Club and the committee. Um, so I'm primarily here to say thank you very much um, for your ongoing support and your funding allocation that has allowed us to upgrade our facilities. So we've got um, new Tiger Perf surfaces. Um, we have a new e-gate system and we have new LED lights. So the club um, and on behalf of the committee are just delighted with the outcome. Um, and I just wanted to extend a real thank you to both Anna Garrity, um, who does all the arrangements for the reserve management plan, and also to Steve Richards, who project managed the resurfacing and the LED light. So if you could please pass on our thank you. Um, so just a couple of quick facts about the club. Uh, we've got uh, 85 juniors that are being coached and we have 120 
um, adults that play interclub. And so the courts upgrades has just extended those facilities, those assets, so we can play at nighttime. We don't have to come into Richmond anymore for winter club. Um, and we expect with the upgrade that the club will probably see an uptick uh, in, in membership. Um, so yeah, that's all I just wanted to say is just thank you very much. We're, we're really pleased. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Helen. I'm sure that the ward councillors um, will be pleased. The RFCs have done such a, a great job in, in Manapur. Sure, and if I could... No, I just think it's a praise. If right, I could, so if, thank could you. Could I just I... add one thing? So um, we appreciate and acknowledge the funding that we have, but we're also really open to working with council and the other clubs that are at the domain. So the, the football and the cricket for shared facilities. So um, I guess I'm just planting the seed what, what might come next. So thank you. So I'm sure the ward councils will be pleased to hear that. There's lots of competition for that for those funds. Right, so um, we'll move on. Um, so declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest for the meeting today? None. Um, no late items, confirmation of minutes. So the minutes of the 24th of August, the open minutes, do I have someone moves that they are a true and correct record? Councillor Kittermore, uh, seconded. Councillor Dowler, I'll put that. All those in favour, please say aye. Against, carried. And then we had the confidential minutes of the 24th of August. I need a mover uh, those. Um, Moved Councillor Butler, seconded Councillor Ellis. I'll put that. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against, carried. So we'll move on to reports. And our first one this morning is Fiona and your team are from uh, NRDA. So I'm sure you've got a big team. And since we haven't seen you since, um, some of you since Tuesday, so it's not long. And normally we have for NADA 20 minutes for your report. How you use that, Fiona, is up to you, but it would be nice if you could leave some time at the end for some questions. So I'm Sarah Jane Weir, and I'm the chair of the NRDA. Thank you very much, uh, Fiona Wilson. Um, and I'd like to introduce as well my colleagues with me, Craig Booty, who's our new visitor destination manager, been with us about three months. Um, and Gareth Power Gordon, who most of you know, I think, um, who's uh, freshly got back from leave, so he's straight into the meeting yesterday. So thank you very much for um, for having us. Um, and I will pass to, um, to Sarah Jane to, to lead off um, to talk about the annual review first. Thanks for those. I, I'm presuming everyone knows that Fiona is our CE. She modestly didn't say that. Sorry. <laughs> so, so it is my pleasure to present our 2022-23 annual report on behalf of the board. And I'll highlight some key points from that full report. So just a reminder first, we were set up in um, 2016, which is a while ago. And I know there were probably quite a few of you not at the table then. We were set up by the Nelson City Council and we continue to be wholly owned by them, currently tasked with regional economic development. So, and we perform the functions of both a regional tourism organisation and a regional development agency. So I presented our annual report at our AGM in September um, and I acknowledge those of you that were able to be there. I noted the mixed year that you'll recall 2022-23 was economically. So you'll remember the positives, some easing of conditions as international connections started returning, the negatives, the multiple challenges impacting businesses and the region's economy, including general geopolitical uncertainty, inflation, workforce pressures compounded by the August 22 floods. We delivered 33 out of 35 key performance measures in our SOI, and we delivered a clean audit against those conditions. Economic development is a long game. Our productivity, 
wages and housing affordability present challenging statistics. So what do we do about that? Our part is to purposefully target our initiatives towards those with the greatest potential to support a strengthened regional economy, higher wages, to help businesses build, resi build resilience, and to position the region for external investment. Through the Kokiri Forum, which is, I'll remind you, the regional collaboration that helps ensure unified priorities for our region, we produced our region's briefing to ministers on the investments that will strengthen productivity and economic wellbeing. So this is the green document. We distributed it to over 60 MPs, um, portfolio and shadow portfolio le le leads and ministers. And we are looking forward to actively engaging further with the new administration once it's in place um, to, to further uh, the knowledge that that contains. Business focus in the region on R&D and digitisation remained strong throughout the previous year. To take one example, our regional business partner team directly facilitated over 1 million external funding into the region in the year. 80% of this was into R&D and that supported over 400 businesses. Skills and workforce are key to a strong economy. So working closely with the Regional Skills Leadership Group, we secured two years funding to host a critical skills and workforce planning role. This focuses on regional growth sector needs over the next five years. When you've looked at our annual report, you will notice it has shined a spotlight on two sections. One you might know a little bit more about than the other. They are the blue economy and our visitor sector. So I'll talk very briefly about both of those. First, the blue economy. From our work we commenced in 2021 with industry and in conjunction with our project lead, Jody Crunch, we leveraged over 1.5 million of external government and industry funding to support the blue economy cluster, Moana Nui. This initiative has significant potential to achieve regional productivity gains and a step change in our marine expertise and capabilities. And I'd like to acknowledge the National Economic Development Award that this region recently won for Moana Nui as the best practice sector and cluster development. I don't think we've got a photo of those, but um, it was a, a really nice event to win. Next, the visitor sector, which you might be a little bit more familiar with. 2022 saw borders reopening. Our sector was then, however, heavily impacted by the August 2022 floods. So what did we do? As well as working with businesses directly in response to those floods, we ran a series of campaigns focused on the domestic market and supporting local businesses, encouraging local, local stay and longer stay and local spend. Campaigns such as themed journeys and holiday challenges. And we acknowledge and thank the visitor sector for their partnership in this. We've probably got a slide now on the uh, SOI for you and have we that I skipped through, no? So I'm coming to the end of my bit and I'm going to hand over to Fiona. The final points I would like to mention, I've mentioned the word collaboration um, a couple of times, are about the people who make this happen. So partnerships and collaboration are a strength of how this region does business and underpin in our view, the unlocking of this region's economic potential. We do thank our partners in the private and public sectors, Te Iwi o Te Ta Uhu and our long-term sponsor, Bowater Motor Group. We recognise and thank um, the dedicated team at NRDA, our board members who are not able to be here today, Dennis Christian, Bridget Geeson, Sam Ng, Matt Pesey, Hugh Morrison and David Johnson. And I particularly want to acknowledge the strong and dedicated team um, who actually deliver all this work, work ably led by our CEO, Fiona Wilson. Thank you, Tasman District Council, for your son, spun funding support um, during that past year. And I, as I said, I'll now hand over to Fiona. Thank you, Sarah Jane. Um, I also want to mention Tony Power, who's behind us, who's our um, manager of finance and corporate. And um, the reason um, we're here together, and apologies from Mark McGuire, is we do have some time for questions. And if we want to get into detail about some of the investment projects, uh, Gareth's here or Destination Management, Craig. Um, so I just wanted to, um, whilst this is technically a report on the um, 
annual report. I thought it'd be useful in this, and it's not technically a six-month report to update um, since the 1st of July and, and what's happening at the moment. So I'll just go back. Right. Um, so, so, so just, and I'll just, I'll just cover it uh, in highlight in terms of the investment area, the business and workforce, and the and the insights area. Um, in investment, business, workforce, and insights, um, we have got a busy year ahead. You'd be pleased to know in the investment and business space. So, we're currently working to profile and present our regional investment priorities to our new government. Um, working with councils closely on this, uh, as you're aware, um, and at the same time working to support private investment into the region. All new ministers and portfolio leads will shortly be receiving our briefing for ministers, the green document, as it's become known. We hear regular feedback and consistent, consistent feedback that the collaborative um, position and uh, that this region puts forward in terms of its regional priorities really does position us well as we negotiate and talk to government about what the priorities are. And the, um, the good, I mean, it's been good news to have in the last quarter the funding confirmed um, for Port Tarakoe stage one, which was um, congratulations to council um, for, for moving that through. Um, but also through Kanoa, some private sector funding, SNAP IT is a major company in the region. It takes several years to move these through. And of course, as you know, in the Port Tarakoe case, longer than that. We'll also be shortly commencing the update of the briefing for ministers. So that, that sets out, as Sarah Jane said, the priorities for the region for investment for the, for the year. They're long-term priorities, but they're the ones that are identified to most closely shift the dial in terms of productivity and economic growth. So we keep that updated every year. We consult with uh, through the Corkery Forum and Council where those priorities are. And the idea is to keep that continually in front of government and so that we're presenting that, that collective voice to support businesses in the region uh, for investment in skills, we've been working with industry to produce a wide and widely distribute, distribute a regional investment prospectus paired with a live work guide, and more recently, a blue economy investment prospectus in partnership with Moana Nui. So we continue to partner and support Moana Nui. There's a picture of the, um, of the award there, which we're really delighted to receive um, because it was recognized a couple of weeks ago as national best practice for cluster development to have got that far with it. So our role now in working to help establish that and working with private sector, we continue to be a partner with that. We're on the board of that. We continue to partner with it in investment in investment activities and in and in growing the um the the, the strengths of the business environment for those and to, to connect up the businesses within it. Currently, there's 21 businesses from the original nine founding members. That will be 30 by the end of the year. Businesses such as Farmlinks Extract, Trinder Engineering, uh, they're spread across the whole region. I'm just going back one. So still on sectors, we're also establishing a new food and beverage value-added partnership program with industry funding support. Following our first event recently with over 40 attendees, we've, conf we've now got confirmation from ANZ and Visa that they'll bring a major marketplace event to the region in early 2024. This is really exciting. It's only been held in the North Island before. It's, uh, it's going to be held at the, um, check I've got the name right, Annisbrook, uh, and they're targeting around about 40 businesses to attend. ANZ and Visa estimate it represents an investment of about $100,000 on their part. What it will do, um, it will bring together a whole range of companies in the food and beverage sector. Um, it'll be um, look at exporting, capability workshops, upskilling, and a marketplace in the afternoon. In business support in our RBP program, Sarah Jane mentioned the, um, the, con the continuation of that program. It continues at, at pace. We talk about it each time we come here, but the demand for the support, um, whether it's business capability, lean, access to R&D funding, access to funding advice, it's, it's not, doesn't diminish. That program works particularly with the, the high value, high growth companies, but it also has a, um, a, a capability funding arm to it as well. So this year alone, since the 1st of July, they've engaged with about 66 companies and brought in about 335,000 of investment into those companies. New in the data and insights program, which is a continual program of information. This year, we changed the um, the regional business survey from a quarterly survey, which was established during COVID to get that quick um, quick response in. Now it's annual, so still partnering with NBS to sponsor that 
survey and with the chamber and uh, in the most recent survey in the first annual survey we've attracted just over 400 responses to that so we'll keep that going as an annual survey in um the, some positives mentioned in that was i'll just touch on that is what we noticed particularly was and very typically higher confidence in our own business higher confidence in the regional than confidence in the national um, economy uh, that obviously negatives are no surprises in terms of overwhelmingly rising material costs, staffing costs, revenue decline. These, these same factors also identified as concerns going forward. In staffing, uh, slightly less in terms of staffing costs and more concerns about um, well-being. Uh, pos positives were, um, were the increased domestic activity, particularly in the returning international visitors. Local support measures were identified as being really helpful, uh, particularly in tourism and retail promotion, local economic development support, networking and collaboration, but also in infrastructure and facilities development, improved employment and housing. In skills and workforce, we're in year three of the Education to Employment program. It, that's, you, you may have, we've talked about that before. This is a program that really is about inspiring school students into, into regional industry careers. It's about showcasing industry opportunities, taking the kids out to the industries, show, events such as Fantastic Futures, Inspiring Careers, um, the Life Lab Workplace. This year, our program lead, Ange Campbell, in that area has engaged with 2,000 school students and, um, and 90 businesses to engage with that. So we had an event last night to bring together the leadership level of the schools, all schools, all high schools across the region, and, um, and the leaders within the schools themselves, um, so that we're tackling it at both areas. But really, um, there's just such engagement, and we really, really thank the businesses for becoming involved in that for hosting. And also in skills and workforce, Sarah Jane mentioned that we'd recently um, been approved funding for the critical schools role. We'll be going to recruitment of that over the next two months. That's really to look at what's the pipeline of skills and needs that we're gonna need with some of these big developments, such as the hospital happening over the next five to 10 years. What's the pipeline of skills we've already, what are the skills needs, what the pipeline coming through and therefore what training and additional support do we need to be bringing in? So we've got that, that's two years funding which will deliver over, over three years. And just turning to the visitor economy and just updating on that. Um, so Craig's obviously new in the role. He's been really working hard at building our visitor partner program. At the end of the, in the annual report, it talks about, um, about I think it was about 63K. We're up to 100,000 now and 53 members of that program. This was a very strong program prior to COVID. And during COVID, we paused the program. Companies were not in a position to be contributing. And we've reintroduced it again this year. We're still targeting working working at that. That partnership is really important to enable our marketing and promotions for the region. And uh, and and thank you to Craig and the team um, for for their work with that. Following some so in terms of recent activities, so uh, following the Winter Journeys themed cam ca campaign, the Spring Activity campaign um, recently delivered about four four and a half thousand connections to operators, and the Autumn campaign is currently under development. We host a steady stream of visiting journalists, international tour operators, and media interest to write up and profile the region and showcase them. Some examples might be a recent example, um, would be uh, Dish Magazine, who will be doing a spread on the region in the January edition of Explore Travel Australia. Last week, Sunrise TV um, was live streaming from Kai Terry Terry. That's a huge breakfast uh, spot for Australia. So uh, we do put a bit of effort. We put effort into th those hostings and really showcasing the region. The team presented directly to Tourism New Zealand recently in Auckland. I think we're one of the only regions in the country to do that directly and they and, and really put across the um the um the strengths that this region's got to offer so in our international profiling of the region the, the partnership with tourism new zealand and air new zealand for example are really important that we can we can leverage that the events team uh work continually to support a stream of events Yes, there's the um, Nelson Events Fund, but we also manage the Regional Events Fund through government, um, which supports events right across the region. The um, the Bay Art event was one that was supported through the REF Fund, and upcoming through that fund over the next six months is the New Zealand Antique Classic Boat Show, the Feast Pocketoo, and the Mochueka Kai Fest through that one. And not only 
through the funding, but also the events team. You know, when we have events such as um, car rallies, and um, when they, whenever they're coming to the region, we, we actively provide them with a lot of information to extend their stay, to bring to, to return, um, but also the at the added activities. And coming up, Crave got great plans for capability building program with the sector, including AI, service standards, and cultural understanding, and new product development in uh, working with operators. And I think things like the uh, there's a new um, EV rental car uh, route, for example. And other things heading into summer include plans for a mountain biking promotions cluster and quite a bit of filming activity in the region, which um, is sort of the filming that we can never name sometimes, but but that really benefits a whole range of businesses, whether it's our um, companies providing the technical equipment, the rental of the videoing, the helicopter companies, you know, some of those, those really do uh, spread far and wide in terms of benefits. So just to, just to close, looking forward, uh, the, board, the board and the team at NRDA have been ref refining our value proposition um, to, to look at in terms of our next three year plan of activity. We do keep a focus on productivity. It is one measure, but it's an indication of the of the well, well-being and, and um, competitiveness of the region. And we keep that as a lens as, as, as we work on uh, across all our programs. We do have great opportunities here as a region now, really now is the time. Th things are tough, but we talk about biotech, we talk about blue economy, and obviously the return of international visitors. Now is the time to re keep ramping up our investment attraction work. Um, councillors are well aware um, of our ask for a greater balance of funding between the two councils as we focus on regional economic development, given our critical mass of scale, our spread of industries um, and our infrastructure. Um, so, And we urge this to be included in your long term plan considerations. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you, Fiona. Now, we'll just see. Oh, we've got a couple of minutes if somebody's got a question. Councillor McKenzie, you're first off the rank, and then <laughs> Councillor Walker. <laughs> cut off this time. Thank you, um, through the chair. Um, I'm just wondering if sort of looking at the possibilities for the region, if you've done any work in looking at um, what I think some perceive to be a lack of a venue for performing arts, um, you know, for example, you know, we never get the full New Zealand ballet here. We miss out on, on, on a lot of opportunities has that been, you know, considered within your portfolio of opportunities for Nelson Tasman to pursue? We we, we did we did um, submit in support of the suggestion that it would be developed as part of the Nelson Arts Strategy. Um, in terms of um, directly a performance arts arts function, that's not something we pursued directly. Uh, but we'd certainly support the opportunity for greater infrastructure of that because I, I you know I, I agree. The other thing lacking is a large conference centre, um, and the uh, and so the opportunity for that has been looked at on and off. Uh, the more infrastructure we can have, more infrastructure to attract those things. You know, we we hear um, events will come if we have more, or more visitors will come if we have more accommodation, and it's actually we've just we've just got to keep um, build addressing the seasonality of our visitors, but so we've got demand. Um, but certainly that was included in the um, in the art strategy we did submit in support of that, but it's not when we've done a direct feasibility on ourselves. Councillor Walker. Thank you, and through you, the Chair. Um, this question's for you, Fiona. Uh, thank you, team, for your presentation. Um, you talked about the education to employment. Is your focus to try and keep our school leavers here, or is your focus with that to send them elsewhere for studies and then try and attract them back? Oh, um, this is Gareth's portfolio, so I'll spend a second, but it's essentially it's both. Um, we want to inspire them that there are careers with high value jobs that they can do here to expose them to the industry opportunities that are here, but also to the, de the, the breadth of jobs that are there. So we're literally trying to inspire future careers. So they might go away, they might do their study, and they might see that there's this range of strong businesses that are here they can come back to to work. But we also want to see they've got local opportunities. And Gareth's going with this button, so I think he wants to... I'll just add the clarification that the education to employment program that Ange delivers is a central government contract based on vocational education and career pathways within region. But NRDA and our investment attraction work has a broader role to play in terms of that, trying to encourage people to come back to the region. So we are working closely with universities around 
what business engagement can they have with Nelson and Tasman businesses so that students who do go away see their own region when they are at university in Canterbury or somewhere else, but also see that there are career pathways back into the region. But that's not part of the specific E2E role because that's central government funded. One last question. Councillor Schalker. That'll only be short. Um, uh, thanks for your report, guys. Mine's on the schools and workforce one as well. Um, obviously, with the, the youths, really great. But is there any um, sort of thing that you're looking to do with people that have actually left school? Because I know a lot of people that in their tw you know, early 20s, 25, that still don't know what they want to do. And I think there's a real opportunity there to possibly, that with some sort of, I don't know, call it a, a, a program you could run that they could go and have a look around some different sectors of what we do in Nelson Tasman, keeping some of those people here. It's just thinking more outside of just the school. Um, so we don't deliver that program directly. However, um, we are part of the Regional Skills Leadership Group and uh, Rangitahi and Youth is the focus of that group. Um, also older workers trying to, 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 to get them back in or keep them in the workforce. And that's looking at how we how we reach out, um, not just the needs of the not employment education, but also, as you say, widen the opportunities. So we're part of that group and that is a focus of that group. All right, so we'll have to leave it there. So uh, Sarah, Jane, Fiona and your team, thank you very much for your presentation and the work that you do. It's uh, I'm always amazed at... Um, how well we do with central government, uh, and it certainly got better over the last couple of years than in the past. I think at times we got forgotten in the past. So look forward to seeing you again. Okay, thank you. And please, please always get in touch directly with me if there's anything you want some information for or find out more. And um, please don't wait to learn an update. Just get in touch. Thank you. Okay. All right. So uh, Julie, uh, Julie Catchpole from this. Uh, Bishop Suter Trust Art Gallery. Um, welcome, Julie. It was a pleasure to attend your um, AGM. I think I've done the last three, um, and I'm always amazed at uh, the art that you display. So, again, you've got 20 minutes, but don't feel that you have to use it all um, because we have got a full program. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. And as I was introduced, I'm Judy Catchpole, the director of the Suta Art Gallery. Um, thank you for squeezing us in. I'll try and be as brief as possible. This is first slide. Uh, next year, from the middle of the year on, we will be celebrating 125 years uh, serving this uh, community. The Suta opened in 1899. How does this? How do we make this? Oh, yeah. Okay. So we deliver a number of uh, outcomes to both Nelson City Council and Tasman, and I've just highlighted here on the slide two of the main <clears throat> outcomes that we deliver to that we provide access to a range of social, cultural, educational, recreational opportunities in our facilities and through activities that we put on. But we also contribute to the economy through being a tourism attraction and through retail, uh, which in our, in our case is skewed to uh, regional artists from Nelson and Tasman. Uh, what we offer and deliver, we're a successful arts attraction and visitor destination. We get more people through than uh, a number of art galleries and much bigger centres. We put on exhibitions that provide, uh, profile Nelson and Tasman artists. We provide what's now called enriched local curriculum, it used to be called learning experiences outside the classroom for students across our region community education programs and activities, and we have an art collection. And lately we've been creating Suter's Tasman Art Walks, which I'll show you a bit later. Just to 
give you a bit of an update about where we are tracking uh, quite positively. It looks bad on this graph because it looks down here, but this is only four months of this financial year. So we're tracking quite well. This graph is just divided into what we call general visitors and then those that come in to use our venues. Uh, we have a theatre in, in our venue as well as the, the galleries and the cafe. Not sure where should I be pointing this? Just like that magic. So this is how we we are tracking. Here we are. Here, this line here, which I'm pleased to say is on a steady trajectory uphill for this financial year. So I'm I'm really chuffed about that. So I'm thinking that we are showing good recovery from COVID. There's a lot more uh, tourists, both domestic and international. Uh, coming to this region and coming into the suitor, as well as our um, locals. But you can see on this graph the various impacts of COVID and, uh, unfortunately, last year, the floods. So here's uh, Tasman, Nelson, New Zealand and overseas is a pie. This is from visitors where we know their origin. There are a whole bunch more that we don't know where they're from because we haven't necessarily interacted with them and surveyed them. Oops, Daisy. Not sure where I'm supposed to be pointing this is the problem. So we put on a program of changing exhibitions on an annual basis. We don't have permanent displays. Uh, in the last financial year, we had two very dramatic exhibitions by uh, Tasman artists. Daryl Frost, you might be familiar with, he's got Fire and Frost Gallery out towards Motueka, and Karen Taylor, which was an amazing exhibition uh, that was light and uh, projections that we ran, coinciding with Taramaroa, the Light Festival, so very well visited. Uh, she's what I suppose you might call a more emerging artist, but this was an absolutely brilliant exhibition. Uh, this is another one that I uh, did last summer called Placeholder, which pretty much celebrates our regional landscapes. Um, Tasman district uh, dominated the main gallery. <laughs> we had Nelson Landscapes in another another part. Some of these we hope that we will deploy in further of the art walks. Oops, sorry. So this is the Suter Schools Education Programs, Enriching Local Curriculum. We discovered we were the only standalone South Island art gallery to actually get a Ministry of Education uh, grant for putting, providing ELC. The museum here also got a grant, but we are now amongst very few across New Zealand that have been receiving these uh, contracts with the Ministry of Education to deliver uh, structured curriculum related programs to students. So our target is 4,000 students from across Nelson Tasman. And in this last financial year, we delivered programs to 5,000 students from 37 different early childhood through to secondary schools. And 43% of those schools were from the Tasman district. And so far this year, uh, we're, we're plotting very well against our target and 45% of the students that have come through are from Tasman District Schools. So the, our education delivery is uh, principally on site. But we also do commit what I call community education or public programs. And so we have a lot of activities, workshops, tours, talks, lectures, 
and including off-site. Um, there's your, yours truly at the top there doing how to look at art at the Richmond Library, which uh, is very enjoyable working with, with the library to put these um, sessions on about every six, six to eight weeks. But we also con contribute to various um, community-wide initiatives such as Te Ramaroa, the Nelson Arts Festival and so on. We have a collection and we continue to add to that. The collection or artworks are paid for entirely by fundraising. Uh, there's no funds go into that from either council. Uh, this is one we're just about to hang on the wall. It arrived this week. Uh, this is Michael Dell, um, with a view many of you will be familiar with. <laughs> The Tasman, Suta Tasman's Art Walk. One of our hopes is that we can get our collection out into the community and more well known and more loved and um, useful also for things like uh, tourism. So we started here in Richmond and we now have 10 works in Richmond, another one about to go up soon and hopefully more in the future. We've got at least 11 in Motueka, and our next uh, plan is to um, put works up in Takaka. Probably in Golden Bay, there will be mainly images that pertain to Golden Bay. And all this activity has been funded through seeking grants and generous donations from the community as well as the willingness of building owners and so on to participate. Uh, here, the, this image at the top, I'm doing a, a tour of the uh, art walk in Richmond. Uh, top right is Wallace Street in Motueka, and bottom is one of my favorites, which is on your building. <laughs> now behind the big bus stop. Uh, here's an, an, an install outside um, Ministry of Social Development in Motueka and another one on Wallace Street, two artworks on the Guardian building. We also support artists through other things. For instance, the Nelson Suter Art Society, which uh, has premises inside our built building, which is an entirely volunteer-run organisation, but a portion of their membership are Tasman artists, and in the foreground here is Peter Kopp. Our Suter store, which we try to sell unique products from artists in Nelson and Tasman. We represent Tasman artists and our friends of the Suter, which are our supporters. So just to put onto our financial landscape, um, and just to gently make the point that our grant from Tasman uh, hasn't been increased or has remained this at the same level for the last nine years. And I'm hoping as we look to our, the next 10 year plans that there might be a consideration about adjusting, adjusting that the same actually relates to our grant from the Ministry of Education, which I'm enormously grateful that we get, but of course um, costs have gone up. Here's just a, a snapshot of where the changes in costs. It, just in um, perspective, our the grant from you relative to our insurance bill. Our insurance bill is just just short of the grant. And I have to say with the floods, we're mighty grateful that we had good insurance. Change. Here's what we spend our money on. Personnel is the biggest area of expenditure. We are open seven days a week, virtually every day of the year. But nonetheless, for that operation, we only have 
8.5 FTEs. So we're a pretty lean, lean operation. Uh, there's the revenue, uh, Nelson and Tasman. All the rest of our revenue is self-generated from uh, rents, leases, uh, venue activity, donations, seeking sponsorship, fundraising, uh, sales, retail, and uh, interest on investments, some of which are from the bequ uh, tag bequests. So our gentle request is that you perhaps consider increasing uh, our grant or, or at least providing a CPI adjustment in your next uh, plan. And that's me, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Julia, and, you, and you've got a couple of minutes, so uh, more than a couple, actually, so it would be nice to get ahead. So has anybody got any questions, Julie? Council Shalcross, and then Council Kinsey. Um, yeah, thanks for the report. Um, my one's just on the street art. Um, I've got a, I know there's a spot for some street art in Richmond I've been approached about. So what's, what's the procedure with that? We just need to contact you and how does that work? Send me an email or give me a ring um, and uh, we'll, we'll look into that opportunity. We The process for doing the art walks it generally involves selecting an appropriate image, getting the permission of the building owner and the tenant, or the tenant the building owner, and uh, copyright. But we've got the wherewithal. We will certainly consider doing that. Yeah, because I see some real opportunities, um, especially around the walls that are basically getting a bit of tagging and stuff on them. So it's obviously getting the permission of the building owners, that's, which is what I'm doing at the moment before I go any further. But oh, that's it's super exciting, yeah. If I can just add a comment to that. Uh, one thing about the Art Walk Base in Nelson and these areas, there's been no tagging on it or um, def defacement, so it is actually providing quite a good service to uh, building owners and the enhancement of civic areas. Yeah, because I think there's some sort of coating they can put on also onto the, the street art that, that's easy to remove the tagging, so yeah, that's definitely cool. But Councillor McKenzie? Thank you through the chair and um, thanks, Julie, for your presentation. Um, so, you know, a large chunk of your costs there are, are your personnel costs and, and you're open um, seven days a week, 365 days of the year. I'm sure you've looked into this, but I would be interested in understanding more what your data shows in terms of um, numbers of people coming through on each day of the week and then particularly over those statutory holidays. I mean, I, I guess what I'm looking for is data to support the value proposition and being open um, for that length of time. Uh, up to this year, we've opened 362 days of the year. Uh, we had been closed Good Friday, Christmas Day and New Year's Day. This year we have decided that we will, on the basis of statistics and evidence, um, to close or be closed on Boxing Day and the 2nd of January, that other statutory. But otherwise we're open all other statutories and um, weekdays. And it varies um, and who the visitors are over the over a year. Of course, in the summer period, there's a lot of um, locals bringing in their, their friends, family, uh, relatives, as well as domestic and international tourism. And we can expect this summer, 2024, there'll be a lot of people also for the Adam Music Festival and using, using the suitor who'll be here for an extended period. During the, the winter, it's primarily locals, but our um, film, the film festivals that we have in our theatre attracts you know, a broader audience as well as our 
education activity in our changing program of exhibitions. So it, yes, it does vary a bit across the year. Um, probably one of the quieter months would be, or well, traditionally had been October, but it's, there has been a change in tourism pattern and that even now October does seem to be, a tr we're seeing more domestic and international coming in. Oh, thank you. I mean, I guess what this tells me is you've got a good handle on your data, so yeah. yeah. Councillor Kittemont. Thank you through the chair and thank you for your presentation. I think the suit would be lost without you. Um, what the suit is so well known in the district here, how do you promote it outside of the district by getting people from Auckland coming down here and coming to the suit? Is, have you got any program for uh, extending your reach out to other parts of New Zealand? We do uh, work in closely with uh, NRDA and Unit New Nelson and campaigns that they will be running. Uh, we advertise in specialist art um, journals as well as more general um, journals and have articles in magazines that have long shelf life that are nationally dis distributed. We have been doing some promotion in the airport, our airport here, but with Go Media, who, who extend elsewhere as well. And and we do sometimes link into other campaigns that are, uh, are nationally focused or internationally focused. We certainly work in closely with NRDA, for instance. All right, well, thank you, Julie. And uh, I will remind you that uh, you do need to make sure that you do submit on the um, long-term plan. So um, a written submission, and I'm sure Alan Bywater is probably contact. But there's a process anyway. So I'm sure you've submitted before and you'll do so again. So thank you very much. Thank and, you. And uh, very good presentation. And I must say, I always enjoy my visits to the art gallery. The invitations out there for you all to come on a, a front and behind scenes tour. Hopefully, we can affect next uh, next year. Okay, we'll bear that in mind. Uh, I'm sure if you contact uh, the mayor's um, executive assistant, she'll put it out there. Thank you. All right, so we'll move on to reports. The first one is my chair's report, which will take us red. I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank John and his team for their work during the year, seeing this is our um, our last meeting, and I know how hard they work. I go up there and see them, and uh, particularly in some of our areas, they we get an awful lot of work out of them for uh, the hours they're supposed to be here. They're here a lot more. So I'm happy to move my report. Do I have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Alice, any questions? I was just um, uh, about the Pupu Springs um, monitoring. I'm just wondering what the council sort of. Uh, yeah. What, is it? Is it That's right. well, I know that it's coming, and I think uh, Mr. Johnson is actually going to talk about that in his report. Okay. So it'll All be right. covered a little bit later in the meeting because yeah. there's a plan and not finalised yet, but I know that it's coming in place. Okay. Because it's a legal obligation. Yeah. With that. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, no other questions. I'll put my report. It's uh, been moved by me, seconded by Councillor Ellis. All those in favour, please say aye. Against, carried. And then we'll go to the next report is Environmental Policy Work Program Reset. Barry, you're up. <laughs> Let's see if I can use this technology. <laughs> Morning, Chair. Morning, Councillors. Um, I will take the report as read, uh, just noting that uh, this report uh, is to confirm direction that um, the team received from you all at a workshop in August. Uh, we didn't have a strategy and policy meeting in September, so it's been a while coming, uh, this report. So um, it reflects that direction that, that you provided us or provided the team earlier in the year. I guess the key thing is um, we're trying to in some ways, future-proof the work program. There's a lot of uncertainty at the moment. Everything's up in the air in terms of legislation reform and commitments 
that various parties have made in terms of what they're going to do with the RMA. Um, so what we're trying to do is, is we can't sit on our hands. We want to progress work that's really important to Tasman. And so hopefully this will allow us to keep working um, in spite of the turmoil that's uh, kind of around us in the next couple of years. So happy to take questions, thank you. Right, so any questions, uh, Council Mara? Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, just Barry, in terms of 4.11, the funding received to support um, the AEWE and that work, is that funding secured and here? Not, it's not like other funding that could be here and now is in doubt of being removed? Uh, no, we have received that funding and we have spent it all as well. So it's been um, it's been circulated to everyone involved. On, on that basis, Mr Chair, I'm happy to move. I've got a mover. Have I got a second? And Councillor McKenzie. And Councillor McKenzie, would you like to speak? Um, thank you. Um, you know, honestly, it does my head and when I'm reading, you know, these reports and, and the changing landscape in which you and your team are having to operate. And I really, uh, I feel for you because I, I think it must be quite confusing. Um, you know, my recollection in terms of the work that we were doing on the TEP, it was a significant cost over a long period, which I seem to recall we were loan funding at the time. So I guess my question to you would be, how can you convince me that you've paired it back uh, to something which is reasonable given um, the deficiencies we've got in the current TRMP and the changing landscape and, and not wanting to pursue work which might be um, a sunk investment. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Look, we've we've scrapped, we've we put a lot of effort into working through what we thought was um, a best approach to to forging ahead with things that are important to Tasman, things that need to change. We do have the laws, the law as it stands, so we do have a bunch of statutory obligations and, and timeframes in there. So um, the work that we were doing on the whole of plan review, we've paused it um, so we can resume it once we've got a bit more clarity, whether that's one plan for Tasman or it's one plan for Nelson Tasman. Um, so we're very conscious that we don't want to do work where there's a risk of having to redo it. Um, so we're very confident that what we've put in front of you is stuff that we can we can progress in, in a relatively um, short order um, and relatively confident that um, it won't be lost. So that's every so, I can give you. Uh, Barry, just maybe the TRMP um, issues was... The oh, yeah, sorry. Well. Yeah, so we are, through this work stream, um, we are picking up some of those issues with the TRMP. So we do have a log of issues with the current TRMP. Um, and when we do a plan change, we do refer to that log. If there's other things we can pick up, um, we can include them into um, into the plan changes. And we're doing that, for example, with, with the growth one of the housing plan changes, a number of smaller issues um, around uh, visitor accommodation, for example, um, workers' accommodation and fixes like that we're looking to address. And if I could, I mean, um, how is the morale of your team given this changing environment that you're having to, to operate in? Maybe I should, you should ask Jeremy that question. But, uh, but I just gave a thumbs up at the back yeah, of the room. I, I, you know, I think we're doing pretty well. Um, we're working really well with the team. It's, it's an awesome team. Really fortunate to have such a great team um, and everyone's on board and working together. I, um, I also want to say that Barry will continue to down, uh, downplay his leadership. Um, his leadership is exceptional. And I think that flows through for the Astro. So we do an Astro team um, um, survey every year. And, you know, the vibe from the team is actually really, really positive. Um, so we've just got to keep it there, you know, and this is why streamlining the work gives the headspace to do the right stuff. But he will continue to play down, down play his leadership. And I just want to acknowledge his, his leadership. Thank you very much. So, Chair, and, and thank you for your leadership, Barry. I'm happy to second. Just, just a, a question from me, Barry. Um, I would have thought in the next three to four months you'll have a better indication from maybe from this government what they're going to keep out of the changes. Well, 
Well, just uh, in, in terms of, um, you know, if you just take the planning committees down to 14 planning committees, uh, certainly makes a lot more sense to me than 77. So three to four months, maybe quicker. I wouldn't put any money on it. Um, we, we met with MFA officials yesterday, um, and I guess as an indicator of that, uh, senior officials didn't come because they weren't allowed to come because they had a caretaker government. So they were told that they weren't allowed to come because they couldn't speak to us. So, you know. That's not healthy. But, uh, but from our point of view, uh, the interactions that I've had with um, people in the um, central government sector have indicated that we should get something. So, so hopefully we do. So anyway, the motion, uh, no other questions. Uh, the motion's been uh, moved and seconded. I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. Against, carried. Proposed to do now is take a five-minute break so you can get a cup of tea, stretch your legs, so you can get a cup of tea and bring it back so that we do get done by 12 o'clock. How's that? Yeah, well, John saying 10. We are, we're on, on schedule. And you'll note that uh, Councillor Dowler gave me some, eye match, uh, some matches to keep my eyes open because I was up at half past three supporting New Zealand cricket this morning. <laughs> Two yards, one yard for two sixes. We were both caught, cost us the game. We were close. Oh, yeah. No, I'm just, it's just from now. I was being polite. I wasn't going to whistle at you because I'm not, no, no good at whistling. All right, so um, we'll now move on to the climate change update. Update as Barbara and Anna. Yes, Kia ora through the chair. Um, so you have received the strategy and oh, sorry, the uh, the climate change update report. And um, we usually take this as read, but if there are any questions, Anna and I were very happy to respond to them. All right, so uh, you should have all had an opportunity to read the report, which I'm sure you have. And has anybody got any questions in particular? I've got one question. Right. Councillor Butler. Thank you. Thank and then you. Councillor McKenzie. Um, yeah, have we got any um, any clues from... Um, I know that we don't know what the new government plans are, but are any clues coming through about... Um, um, funding for um, climate change, any changes to um, the acts or the bills that are proposed? Yes, thank you. Through the chair, um, at the moment, especially because coalition discussions are undergoing, uh, there is really not a lot of clarity. The three parties have different uh, climate change policy platforms. Um, National is being quite focused on renewables. Um, ACT is, uh, um, ACT, um, the ACT party is, uh, um, the ACT party is suggesting to uh, repel the um, Zero Carbon Act altogether. And uh, New Zealand First has got, has got no climate change positioning at all in the policy that they put forward during the election. So this is quite of a moving type of environment. Um, there are international commitments uh, that the nation has, that we have as a country. There is quite a lot of work and, and investment that is being gone, that done, is including our council. And so that uh, uh, we will be seeing from the outcome of the coalition type of uh, agreement and what this government would look like, and especially we, we will understand which ministry, which party will be assigned which portfolio. At that stage, we will be able to have more of a clear idea. So I'll say within the 100 days. Yes. All right, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor McKenzie. Thank you very much. Um, just a question in terms of the work on the regional climate change risk assessment tool. Um, I know Councillor um, Mailing and myself went to the Richmond um, workshop. I, how do you feel that that work's going in terms of um, the community 
uh, participating and how how confident are you that we're going to end up with a tool that is going to be uh, of great benefit to us? Yes, through the chair. Uh, that's a good question. Um, again, the, the workshop that took place, they were by invite, so they were not really expanded to the whole community. That will be phased and there will be time when that will happen. Uh, it was pretty much so um, the I'm, 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 I'm relatively satisfied about the outcomes. Um, and what I mean by that is that uh, the people that attended the workshops, uh, they actually, uh, different people, different groups, uh, different organizations, asked us to continue the conversations. And so I think that that is a very positive beginning. You cannot have you know, either positive or negative. There is a survey that is going out in the next um, couple of weeks or so uh, to, the, to the to the to the participants, asking how, informing them that we will continue these conversations at community level, and that uh, and how would they would like us to improve. We already have some feedback from certain communities that they asked us we prefer to meet during the weekend, and we would like to have very informal type of conversation. But most important, a number of participants are very interested in understanding better the risks. So that sort of like provide hopefully an answer to your first part of the question. For the second part of the question, um, we, um, confidence about tools um, vary in, 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 in consideration. So we, we need to yet see the final product. Until I do see the final product, um, I, can, I really would like to refrain from making a judgment. So at the moment, uh, so in a couple of weeks' time, we will have the possibility to review the deliverables of this project, and um, any kind of tool improves in time and improves on the quality of data that we have as well. So that will be that step to be done. Just from the chair, they when they had the blue... Um areas on it where it said it was inundated, they didn't have the depth. And I think um, our staff have got those figures for them and they hadn't interpreted it properly. So that, that was a bit that disappointed me. Because if you've got um, five mils of water or you've got 50 mils of water, it's a critical thing going forward because it's about whether your floors are affected or not. So I'll await that with interest. Mm -hmm. Councillor Walker. Yeah, thank you, Sri Uchi. Um Thank you for your good uh, detailed report. Um, yeah, and my question too is around that regional climate change risk hui that uh, all three Mott Ward councillors attended. Um, first, a clarification that we thought it was a drop-in and so did some in our community. So we probably, oh yes, and sorry, Councillor McKinnon office there as well at the Mapua table. Um, I guess the yeah, point of clarification, um, the communication we got was a drop-in. So some of the people arrived partway through, which wasn't as helpful for them or us. Um, there was a question raised around how do people get some buy into the peer reviewing of what was happening, and I'm hoping that we as a, a crew might be able to give some um, direction on that, um, Barbara. And it was great to see the momentum, because, you know, we started some work on this back in 2019, and we had a very big group of concerned residents. And then we put that on pause for whatever reason. Um, and I'd like to hope that now that we've got this momentum and traction that we can go forward. I guess my question to you is, for me, there weren't enough people in the room. So what do we do to actually gain a wider scope of people um, to participate and to get their knowledge and understanding um, and take them on the journey with us through this process? So do you have any ideas around that? Thanks. Um, so through the chair, uh, yes. So um, I, I guess any kind of process can be improved in time. Again, this was uh, by uh, invitation only, but there were in the Motuika case, um, in the Motuika um, workshop, there's some, there were some people that knew of the of the workshop and just dropped in and they were all very much welcomed and so that just just to put a couple of uh, um, in, in, more information there um 
you, you, you're very correct that actually if we were to succeed in resilience building of our communities, we need to have a wider buy-in. And, um, and so that uh, um, for me, for me and for the team here, um, although in 2019, there were the coastal type of adaptation type of hui that took place uh, from 2019 to now, lots of things have changed. It was for me the first time that I could see some people of the communities engaged. And so that with that, I guess that the next step would be that I would like and the team that worked into this project would like to see is just, just to come to the councillors, come to the community board members as well, and really understand how together we can design going forward this conversation. Nobody but you know better the community. There are questions, you know, that, that there are questions that were received about, uh, about, um, about risk. There were some people that were visibly concerned. And so that we just need to bring this conversation forward so that we bring our community and we actually build the knowledge of the community as well so that we really get into this journey together as was the message that um, we provided at the beginning of the, of, of the project. My last question, um, thank you, for you, Chia, is at the end of the hui, we were given six tokens. Can you um, explain to me what happens with, it was very evident uh, that there was one bucket which had way more tokens in than others. Can you explain what happens with that information that was collected from the coin um, practical exercise things? Yes, through the chair again. Uh, the, the coin practical exercise that you're talking about um, is one that uh, the project team was not aware of. So it was chosen by the consultant. It's a very good question. And it's, it's something that we need to uh, actually understand how that information is going to be used in order to be introduced and embraced within the tool. So it's a qualitative type of information, Councillor Walker. Um, I can only say that in the Golden Bay example, in Takaka, actually, the community decided to have a, a, a fourth jar where they just wrote community resilience. All the tokens went on that jar. So the community talks, the community speaks. And so that we will see what the outcome of, of that is that. We will then come back to you when we have some of the results to discuss. And uh, how that is going to be used is not yet clear to me. So I cannot give you a straightforward answer at the moment. Welcome. Councillor Kittemore. Thank you. Um, through the chair, I can only echo what's been said around the table to the three of you, but also there's a lot of team behind you who put a lot of work in. So I think on behalf of the Mapur councillor, uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I've read your report and the term natural hazards keeps on coming up through it. Can you please clarify what you mean by natural hazards apart from a climate change? Um, I presume we're not talking about an earthquake. Yes, natural hazard is earthquakes. That's what it is. And there is there is a difference between weather-related hazards and natural hazards like earthquakes. And um, the if you do recollect, um, the climate response strategy brings together the two disciplines, climate change and natural hazards. And so that when we talk about climate change, we need to, con to, have, to consider as well uh, natural disasters. Okay, so at our MOT meeting, I don't remember anyone talking about AEF8, which is going to be hitting us today, tomorrow, and next week? Yes, through the chair, very good question. And you might recall that uh, the consultant at the beginning of the workshops uh, explained that we were looking only at climate-related hazards. And so we're looking at flooding, we were looking at uh, sea level rise, coastal, weather-related hazards. So in that, that day, during that moment, natural hazards, they were not considered. But the geospatial tool that we are developing takes in consideration as well natural hazards. All right, so uh, we've got a motion just to receive the report. So, uh, Councillor Kittermott, would you like to oh, move that? Certainly. And Councillor Walker, second. All right, so move Councillor Kittermott, seconded Councillor Walker. I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against, 
carried. Thank you. So then we moved um, to CAT and its annual progress report on Tasman Climate Change Action Plan. Yes, kia ora kato, through to Chair, um, just bringing the annual progress report um, for the TCAT, uh, for the Tasman Climate Action Plan, taking it as read and happy to answer any questions. Right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start before Councillor McKenzie. I was just saying, uh, to me, the, the biggest thing that we've done is changing our public transport. So, um, and it's a real win-win um, story. I was on a bus this week where there was standing room only in the morning going from Richmond into town. Now, a significant number of them were um, high school students and uh, school kids because it's cheaper than um, any other thing. But to me, the cost of fuel and the fact that we've now got a reliable service is going to make a huge difference. And and as I said, most of our emissions are from transport. So as soon as we can get our roads instead of our trucks sitting bolting diesel out um, when they're not going anywhere, the better. So, um, Councillor McKenzie first, then Councillor Murray. Thank you very much to the Chair. Thank you for the report. Um, 5.7, when we talk about the planting that we've done, Teapot Valley, Waimea Inlet, various wetland restoration sites, particularly the Waimea Inlet with 21,200 being tree species. So are we able to register uh, these areas into the ETS? Um, through the chair, that's something that the gov past government was looking at and it has not actually happened yet, but we are keeping an eye on that and if we can, then we would. But yeah, not just yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we've certainly planted well over 50,000 trees, so it'd be nice if we could in the future. Uh, Councillor Murray? Thanks, Mr Chair. I'm just struggling with my thing, but obviously I'm there. So, so 5.3, um, can I just check with 5.3 that um, they did purchase the boiler, and that's... Oh, I'm just not sure if that's going to be the long-term solution. So it's in terms of the... Um, the business unit 5.3 and the, and the use of the landfill. So I know that they currently own the border, but isn't there proposed changes around that? Yeah, through, through this year, the um, long term plan of the business unit is to sell it back to the DHB, um, but that hasn't happened yet. And then at 5.5, uh, what do I know? It's not 5.5. Oh my goodness, I must have had a late night bookmark problem. Somewhere on page 33, there must be something that has to do with um, supporting healthier homes. And I think, I think council will come on and ask before, but do you know if our council housings comply with healthier homes? Well, back to you. That's the same question then again. I would hope so. <laughs> I know that uh, every time somebody vacates, those um, individual units are updated to... Um, Bring them up to standard. Okay, so my question then is, do we know from a, we're, we're doing this great initiative in the community, do we know that all of our council housing complies with the healthy homes? person who could answer that best for you would be Jane and Grant's team. Well, well, teams. we'll, we'll come back to you. Do you. Does everyone want to see that? Yeah, okay. So I think there might be one more. Um, it's a Tasman year because it's the action plan. So it's down in 45. So I get how we're currently tracking in terms of the emergency fund and using potentially debt headroom for it. But still, shouldn't we have a policy? Because the, if there's an emergency event, it's still going to happen. Just because we don't have reserve funds, won't we still need a policy and a process to address it if it occurs? That is. Alan? Sounds like you're coming to pick that one up through, through you, Mr. Chair. Well, um, that policy uh, deals specifically with how to use those emergency reserve funds. So, if you haven't got any reserve funds, there isn't really much point having a policy. So, that's so. Would there be a policy that deals with how you resource the works without a reserve fund? There's no, so I can thank you, Mr. Chair. There's no proposal at this point to have a policy along those lines. We we have talked about broadly how we would um, we would fund 
the recovery. So, so through through kind of reprioritizing existing programs, um, and then through uh, through debt headroom. Uh, again, recognizing that if you use that debt headroom and you spend the money to do the recovery, you, it's likely then to have on a flow on impact on, on rates increases in future years to service in and ultimately um, repay those loans. Thank you. Sorry that I didn't have a question for either of you three. All right, Councillor Butler. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, could I just have a clarification about the Climate Action Plan as to whether we are working off the updated one or whether we're working off the original one, because I remember going through a process to update it, but this one says 2019. So where are we up to with the work that's been done to update? Through the chair. So, yes, you're correct. We are reporting at the moment on the current approved plan, which was approved in 2019, and at the same time we're working through the process of updating that plan and adding the strategy component to it. So the timeline for that is... We've had public feedback earlier this year, which we're actually bringing back to you for a workshop in mid-December to discuss. And then that will go out as a supporting document to the LTP in March, April. Um, and then the timing is for the new strategy and updated action plan to be approved straight after the LTP because it's got its budget components tied to it. So then next year we'll be reporting on hopefully the new version. Yeah, but this year we're still the 2019 version they're reporting. Right, I, I just can't recall now about how different the one the one that's currently in the pipeline is, and um, you know if it's this is 2019, if there are some significant differences, and it's been really brought um, up to uh, you know modernised or whatever, then it would be good to know get some reporting against that rather than just, uh, you know, always being behind the eight yeah, quarters. We could start um, reporting on that in the next quarterly reports that come back in the climate update reports, if that's what you're interested in. Yep, sure. Right, thank you. Right, um, Grant, you were going to give us a bit of an update. He, he skips to come downstairs to respond, so very quick response. Healthier homes in relation to our, um, they're not retirement homes, they're actually pensioner housing. Okay, thank you. Um, I can confirm that all our uh, community housing meets the healthy home standard. I've had that confirmed for me just uh, in the last few days. But, okay, thank you for that. So that's nice okay. to know. And I am aware that uh, they do get updated after every, when a person vacates. And I think there was a previous question on the double glazing and um, that's not a requirement for any of our uh, units. Uh, it's triggered if it's a new a new build or something like that, it'd be different. So the new ones that uh, the AAT ones are probably double glazed because they were only done, oh, they'd be nine years ago, but I think they were double glazed. The others won't be. Yeah. All right. Uh, Councillor Dowler, you had a question, so thanks for that, Brian. It's more of a comment, really. Um, under Section 5.5 regarding the update of the car park out here for the new fleet of electric vehicles. Congratulate the council for doing that, getting ahead of the game. I know a friend of mine in Gisborne, they had 44 electric vehicles turn up one weekend and there wasn't a charger on site. So they had uh, six weeks of absolute mayhem trying to keep these things going for their staff. Had to employ another employee and then drive around town and push in in front of other people to keep their vehicles going. So well done. Look forward to seeing the fleet parked out there. Once the electric fleet or hybrid fleet's going, I won't feel so bad when I start my V out and go for a Sunday afternoon drive. I'll double you on my e-bike, so it's all right, Barry. <laughs> you and I on an e-bike together will be something special. Uh, right, so, um, Councillor Dalla, are you happy to move uh, the report? And I'm trying to find the page. Yes, I will be. But it's to receive, to receive the report. Move, Councillor Dalla. Seconded, Councillor Walker. I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against. <laughs> well, if you asked a question, you're definitely going to be asked to move a second. That's just the way it goes. Uh, right, so uh, draft community facilities funding policy. Alan, I think that's 
Yeah. Oh, no, we've got to do the Richmond and uh, Lakes Murchison management plan. Um, did you speak to Deputy Mayor Bryant um, in the last few days to make sure he was happy? Yeah. Because oh. it's a big part of the area is his patch. I didn't. I'm sorry. He would have raised it with me if he was concerned. I note that uh, for Richmond, it's 20 years, roughly. And for his ward, it's about um, 16. Yeah, that is 2023. <laughs> um, and I think it's 18 years for the Lakes Murchison one and 24 years for the Richmond one now. So it is getting on there. That, that overdue by quite a while. Right, so um, any questions? Councillor Stakey. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Further here. Um, just around the Richmond Ward, are we happy we have capacity and the team is able to deliver that in the timeline? It's quite a big task given the amount of new reserves and the time since it was last done. So are we confident we actually have the resources to do this? Uh, I have been working on this in the background over the past year as well because yes, there's 300 parcels. Um, so I've been slowly working through the process of trying to figure out are they a reserve under the Reserves Act, are they classified or not? Because that's the second part of this process that also has to happen, which is mentioned in the report. Um, and I, I feel like it can happen within that time frame. I've tried to make it realistic. So, yes. Uh, Council Ailes? Uh, thank you, through the chair. Um, I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this question, but um, I'm just wondering what the implications of the representation review uh, would be, given it's a long work program anyway, um, but will that work, how would it fit within the representation review and our possible review of how the war situation is? Um, through the chair, so it, we, you can do later minor amendments to reserve management plans, and I've referred to one in my report here about the new um, agency, Scenic Reserve Land, at, on the other side of the river at um, Wakefield, um, suggesting that we consult on that now because we've recently finished the Motori Waimea Ward RMP, um, and then later just do the minor change. So that could easily happen that we just switch around which reserves go on which plan after the process, and that wouldn't be a problem. Any other questions? Because um, I know it's a lot of work. Yeah. Councillor Butler? Yeah, just I wondered if um, I know that it's a lot of work. It's going to take a long time. Um, what else have we got left? Is it Motueka and Golden Bay? they the two that will be left. Uh, actually, just Golden Bay, but um, there's at present Tata Beach Reserves have their own reserve management plan, but we're um, suggesting that they just be brought into Golden Bay Ward 1, so there'd just be the one review happening oh, for Golden Bay. Yeah. Okay, after this, thanks. Okay, so um, the reports contain, or the, the, the resolutions contained on page 52, um, Anna's answered questions about capacity, and I see you're not pointing, wanting to appoint panels or anything at this stage. Um, so that'll happen down the down the track. So is I'm happy to move. Move Councillor Butler. Councillor Dakey will second. Uh, all those in favour please say aye. Aye. Against carried. Right. So uh, we now move to draft community facilities funding policy. And remember it's a draft. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, so uh, hopefully you will remember that this policy uh, originated in discussions uh, during the during, a, during the LTP process um, concerning the funding of community facilities, and particularly um, it recommends a modest change to the sort of level of, of contribution we would expect in the future from community fundraising. So that it, it changes that from the current sort of thirty percent to. A situation where it's 30% for for the first $3 million of the project and then becomes 20%. So effectively reduces slightly the amount of fundraising we would expect from, from the community. And the corollary of that is it increases the, the, the portion that the, the council would pay, um, funding through things like RFCs and, 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 and rates where necessary. Um, so 
Um, so that's, I guess, the key change uh, to our current position. Um, it also sort of codifies our current practice and policy around the application of the district facilities and shared facilities rates, which are not well kind of documented currently. So we're kind of really trying to document what we're, we're sort of already doing in that sort of space. Um, uh, if uh, if you adopt the draft policy, the plan would be to consult on it in parallel with the long-term plan. So you happen at the, at the same time as part of that, that conversation and, you know, subject to where we land with the funding of the Montjuica Pool and the other community facilities, it would potentially set quite nicely alongside the, the consultation uh, uh, around those. Um, so with that, I'll take the report as read and happy to answer questions. I'm sorry, Councillor Kittemont, I think I missed I missed you. I hadn't seen your name was on oh, there. Sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, I can see. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right. So, Alan, what I do know from this is this will go out for consultation as part of the long-term plan. So it will yes, for the communities, in particular mm -hmm. those that are interested with two big projects, one in the Waimea Mutri Ward and one in the Motuaka Ward, I'm sure we'll get a lot of input um, in relation to that. We'll start. Councillor McKenzie. Thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to, to move the resolution, although I couldn't help but chuckle when I read that um, it also applied to grandstands. But mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that was fully funded out of council somehow. Um, yeah. Councillor Dakey? Uh, happy to second that. Also, I think it's a good step that for those smaller communities, this represents that it's a big challenge to fundraise for these massive projects in their town. So happy to support. So it's it's about a draft policy. So any uh, other questions? None. Well, you've got off easy. Yeah. No. 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 All right. So it's been moved. Councillor McKenzie seconded. Councillor Dakey. Uh, I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. Right. Against. Carry. We're talking with gas. So I could. Mayor of Nelson could take some uh, lessons from me. We're half an hour ahead of schedule. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, Barry and Dwayne, uh, this one might take a little bit longer, but we've got half an hour. Press your button again. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, so, um, <clears throat> I'll take my part of the report as largely read. This is a few things I will um, point out to you. The first thing is our new staff member. Um, so, Ian, if you could just stand up, please. This is Ian McComb. Um, he has replaced David Arsenault as our senior stormwater planner. And some of you might recognise Ian. Um, Ian used to be our senior stormwater planner a few years ago. <laughs> so he's realised that you're over his ways and come back into the fold. Welcome, Ian. Um, <laughs> nice to have Ian on, um, back on board. Um, the first uh, thing I'd point out in terms of the report is that the early engagement on the CAT bylaw has actually been going really well, or at least the proposition for a CAT bylaw. Uh, we've had over 300 um, informal responses. Um, there is a mix of views in there, you won't be surprised to know. Um, but generally positive, positive feedback um, on the engagement and the, um, in the process. So that's really good to hear, and, and we'll be um, following up that with you once it um, is completed um, later next year. Um, the Infrastructure Acceleration Fund um, work in Motueka West, um, um, pleased to report that Wukatu have submitted a consent um, for their development. Um, it's uh, getting there's a request for further information, yada yada, but um, it's just another signal that um, the, the the IEF and the pro, uh, the IEF projects and the developments intended to support are continuing to um, track as as we had hoped. Um, there's an error in my part of the report. It refers to a wastewater bylaw. Sorry, it's a water bylaw, um, not a wastewater bylaw. So apologies for not spotting that earlier. And just to reassure you around the wastewater philosophy work um, that we will be coming back to council in February or March for a workshop um, to discuss that with you. And depending on the outcome of that workshop, you know, there'll be um, public engagement later next year. So just a few updates for me. Um, now, uh, I have been away for a bit and the speed management plan and the LTP have kind of taken my focus. So if I can't answer a question, I'll need to commit to getting back to you, sorry. Okay, so any questions? And yours goes up to, uh, I wasn't sure what page, and 
because of the technology I'm using today, I can't quite get to where Barry, Barry starts later on. But I did notice of to page 87. Yeah. So the, the good thing was lots of them were green and there was a couple that were delayed, but not too badly. So any questions of Dwayne at this stage? Mackenzie. Council McKenzie. Um, and then Councillor Walker. Thank you. It is about the speed management plan, but you might be able to answer it. Um, <laughs> did we produce a hard copy consultation document? <laughs> um, through the through this year, yeah, there's um, the requirement of the speed management plan process under regulations which means means we have to develop a draft plan. So there's a draft plan which is hard copy and electronic. But that isn't a useful tool for the way we wanted to talk to our community about the speed management plan, which is around, you know, the options are available to us as a community. So there is um, there is actually special consultation material specifically focused on generating, focused around the four options for urban, four options for rural, and seeking people's views. And yes, it, is, it will be in hard copy, assuming it's approved next, revised version of is approved by the RTC next Monday, and available on the web as well. Appreciate Excellent. I just wonder, this is a very minor request, sorry, when we've uh, amended it following the joint committee um, earlier this week, could we, get a, could we get a hard copy in our pigeonholes? Because when we're going to those community meetings, I can tell you people are going to want to engage with us and I feel as though I'm going to need to be really across it. Oh, look. Uh, through the chair, yes, very happy to supply you with a bag each of um, consultation materials. Um, can I can I just add can I just add to that? that I think um, the whole mapping side of things is the power of this. I don't know if you want to quickly talk about the online mapping. Yeah, so there's um, so the consultation materials focused on the um, on the four options. There is an interactive online map that um, the consultation material material directs you to because there are four options. Rural, in every street it's affected in four potentially different ways so there's online material that people can click on um, they can look at their street look at the current speed limit look at the four what the four options would do for that street and all that sort of thing so uh, and they can zoom in and out and look at um, their you know not only their street but their whole community and how it changes so it's a pretty cool tool for people understanding what the options are all right councillor walker yeah thank you and through you chair um Dwayne, can you just confirm, you said something about a wastewater workshop. Yeah, uh, when did you say that was for? Uh, through this year. Um, the wastewater philosophy work um, mentioned in the update report. Um, we're hoping to have a workshop with this council in February or March next year, just to talk about that wastewater philosophy, get your input into it, and then talk about the next steps. Okay, so my question is... For the work that we're doing with our long-term plan currently, with whatever that you share in that workshop, will there be flexibility in the room in our current long-term plan proposals, albeit early engagement, for addressing what you're going to bring to a workshop? Because we're making some decisions well before that workshop, and I have a bit of a concern around the timing. Yeah, through the chair, that's a very good question. Um, the answer is we've provided pretty healthy budgets for um, both the wastewater upgrade slash new plant for Motueka and Takaka. Um, but they should be viewed as provisions, not as, um, you know, uh, a, a budget crafted around a specific solution. Um, what we'll be getting into in particular is around the disposal um, and, and how that should be treated um, and, and, I, and I, I can't guarantee that the provisions will um, be sufficient for what ultimately comes out of that process, but they are fairly healthy budgets as a whole. And the only other thing I guess I would um, say is that we've got two more long-term plans before we get to constructing those projects. So, you know, there's plenty of opportunity to reflect and review um, what the impact might mean for um, wastewater treatment long-term. My understanding is there are years eight, nine, and ten. Yeah. Um, but I did see a request from an iwi group in Motuaka that wants to bring it forward. So I'm sure that's some of the plate that you're getting, Councillor Walker. Yep. Right. So no more questions of Dwayne. Um, we'll move on to Barry. And Barry, there was a question asked about plans for um, 
monitoring Kora Waipupu Springs from board mem member Dixon. Um, and I think it's cut. It, it is in your report, but you might just like to comment upon it. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Thread Chair. Um, I'll take the report as read. Um, in terms of in terms of monitoring, so uh, the council, you know, through the water conservation order process with the court, um, committed to getting an independent review of the monitoring program for uh, the valley. So not just the springs, but for the whole Taikaki Valley. Um, and so the first step in that is is talking to um, Mana Fino Iwi. So we'll be working with Iwi about. Um, What's the what's the scope of that review in terms of reference for that review? So um, that'll be the first step. Uh, we do we have identified um, candidates that can take an independent review that haven't been involved in any of the work previously. Um, so once that's undertaken, we'll find out what needs to change or if anything does need to change in the current monitoring program, and we can take that forward. Board member Dix, through the chair, I just uh, is there any sort of time frame? You have you're working to with the consultation. We'd like to start that review early next year, so as soon as possible. Conversations are underway. John, I am. Um, I did give a commitment that we'd also come and talk to the board as soon as we can and provide a proper overview of all this. So you're over it. Right, uh, Council Butler. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, and just um, acknowledging that, um, you know, that we've got a little bit of pressure of time, haven't we, to, because um, we don't want to let things languish. So I'm just wondering how how we're going to deal with um, the, pro, you know, we've got, got we, is it correct, we're going to have an independent consultant who's going to do the review, is that right? And then we've got to, do the um, work with Nati Tama as well. So is it all sequential or can there be a parallel process of things happening at the same time? Through Chair, there's a number of things happening already. So, um, so the council has, continues to monitor under its existing monitoring program. Um, so the review will indicate whether anything needs to change, and if it does need to change, what will change. Um, at the same time, we've got work um, underway in terms of the action plan around the springs. Um, so that's being led out of Merkel Langford's team, the land, um, land team. Um, so there's a number of parallel work streams that are carrying on. At the same time, we're also um, looking to implement the WCO. So we need to actually implement that through changes to our existing plan. So all those, are, there's multiple work streams that are in parallel at the moment. Yeah. So with that review, can can you just give a little bit more information about how that review will happen, what 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 it will consist of, who will do it? No, sorry, I'd have to get back to you on that. Um, Joseph Thomas is is looking at the technical side of that, um, and that will also involve discussions with with Ewe around around the nature of that review, the scope of that review, potentially candidates for doing that review. So we've kept the. the the conversation, particularly with Nati Tama, has has commenced. Uh, not detail, but certainly a connection. Um, so there's a desire to move really quickly on, you know, on this. So just to give you some assurance that, you know, we're really onto this. Yeah, and it's not just the quality side of things, is it, Barry? It's the quantity side of things. We're very conscious of, particularly with dry weather events potentially happening. All right, so uh, Councillor McKenzie, then Councillor Dow. Um, thank you, through the Chair. Um, Barry, Plan Change 76. So um, we say in the report the hearing will be scheduled for early 2024. Will that be news to the submitters or have you communicated that information to the submitters? Uh, we haven't got a date yet. Um, there's still... We're still working to, I think we've got a resolution um, that works in terms of what we can take to a hearing. Um, it's just a matter of staffing and resourcing to actually get the work done. Um, so there's there's a number of reports that need to be done, um, draft, plan drafting and that sort of thing. And at the moment, we're just a little bit squeezed. So the next step is once we know if we get a date, we'll communicate that with submitters. That's good, because they definitely didn't want to delay this. Um, that was the message I got. Although I thought they were pretty happy in the meeting and then they changed their mind when they came out later. So, um, Councillor Dowler, and then I'll go back to McKenzie. 
Oh, is it? All right. Well, I'm sure Barry will indulge you and let you go first. Well, I, I mean, the related comment is I, I think we do need to be clear that there are there are those who want it to proceed and those who don't want it to proceed. So I don't think we could categorise it as one or the other, Chair. No, you're right. There was definitely both sides. <laughs> Councillor Dow. Yeah, um, Monoraka West Plan Change, I see it's going to be notified probably in December with a submission period running through until late January, early February. Is it early December, mid-December, later December? I think from memory it's the 15th of December Okay, is when it's, um, it's going out. So we want to get it out as soon as possible. It's linked yeah. with um, with the applications that Wakatua put in for consent and the funding. So um, there is urgency in terms of timing around that to, to get the plan change notified. No, it just would have been great. To have, we're going to have a tent at the Mod AMP show to have it there, but it's too soon. It's the 2nd of December. Okay, so no more questions. Um, Councillor Dowler, are you happy to move receipt of the report? Yeah. Councillor McKenzie, are you happy to second? Right, we've got a mover and a seconder. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll put the report, all those, I'll put that motion. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against, carried. Come to uh, Councillor Butler for the closing carrot here. Kia hiki te korero, kia watia, kia mama te manawa o te tangata. Kia uki te ara mo tato e ora nei ko rongo ki runga, kia tine huye taihie. Yeah, yeah.